Making a great game takes a lot of work. That's why not every game that comes out is great. So when we are playing a great game and something in that game just kind of ruins the experience, it leaves a sour taste in our mouths. You know how when you're playing a great game, having fun with it, blowing people's heads off or gathering loot until the wee hours of the morning, and then you come across something that just kind of sours the game for you? It doesn't necessarily ruin the game, but it's bad enough to where you question if you want to keep playing or even if you ever want to come back to the game. That's why I put together this list of 15 great games that had one fatal flaw. Number 15 is Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped and its vehicle levels. Now personally, I loved these levels in Crash 3. They provided a break from the normal gameplay, but I feel like I'm the only one who feels that way. These levels didn't exactly play perfectly. They had very stiff and wonky controls, which I can see how that would annoy some people, especially when they're trying to get those platinum time trophies. This is the main reason most people consider Crash 2 to be their favorite of the original trilogy, which is a shame because if it were not for these few levels, I'm sure Warped would get much more love than it does now. At number 14, we have Jack 2 and its open world. Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy is a fantastic platformer and a great game with a lovable, silent, fun-loving protagonist. So it took us all by surprise when Jack 2 released and, well, I'm gonna kill Praxis! Honestly, most people didn't have a problem with the suddenly vulgar language and guns. What kind of soured the experience for a lot of people, myself included, was the shoehorning of the Grand Theft Auto style open world. It was just so empty and pointless. Literally the only thing you could do in it was hijack other people's hover cars. That's it. And that wasn't enough to justify having to run through these empty streets between every mission you did. It was mind numbing. Just trust me, even if you loved the rest of the game, the open world made Jack too hard to go back to. Number 13 is surprisingly enough Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Now I love this game, it's so fun and unique, and a great game in the Nintendo Switch's library. But the fatal flaw in this one is the writing. It was just really lacking, none of the jokes really hit for me, and they really didn't take advantage of all the potential Mario jokes they could have made. Now this isn't to say the game isn't funny, it is, but all of the humor is physical humor. And yes, the gameplay is great, it's a blast to play, but there is a ton of dialogue in Mario Plus Rabbids and because of the lackluster writing, it took half the fun out of a game like this. And at number 12 we have Animal Crossing City Folk, the last console Animal Crossing released. And for good reason, because Animal Crossing just doesn't do well on consoles, it's made for portable. And that was City Folk's biggest flaw, the fact that it was not portable. The original Animal Crossing on GameCube and N64 was different because back then the strongest handheld we had was the GBA. But after we got a taste of portable Animal Crossing in Animal Crossing Wild World on the DS, there was no going back. Except there was. And that's the problem! This is a huge reason why people want an Animal Crossing on the Switch so bad. They could get the graphics of a console and the portability of a handheld. It's perfect and I'm excited. But don't expect me to go back and play Animal Crossing City Folk anytime soon. Or ever. Number 11 is the original Prince of Persia. Not the original original, but the original one, made by Ubisoft. If you haven't had a chance to play this Prince of Persia trilogy, you really should. They are great games, especially The Two Thrones. That game is very underrated, and I highly recommend you pick it up if you see it on the cheap. But we are going to be talking about the first one, The Prince of Persia Sands of Time. Now this game did a lot for the 3D platform formula. It revolutionized climbing, the fighting was cool, and the mechanic to go back a couple seconds in time is iconic. But the only thing that keeps keeps me from wanting to revisit this game is just how slow it is, mainly the combat. You feel like the game is actually lagging and slowing down every time you swing your weapon. It's not the worst thing in the world, but the more advanced games get, and the faster the combat gets in modern games, the harder it is to go back to this slow motion kind of fighting. I don't know if the devs did this on purpose because of the whole time thing, or if the game is in fact actually slowing down. Either way, it just kind of ruins the game a bit. Coming in at number 10 is actually three games, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, Recoded and 358 over two days. Because all three of these games have the same problem. They are all essentially rehashes of the console titles. Now don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Kingdom Hearts fan. I love me some Sora Donald and Goofy slaying nobody. Well, not nobody, 
and it's complicated. Anyway, all three of these portable Kingdom Hearts titles are great games, and they all are worth playing. Well, except maybe Recoded. But they all have the same flaw. All of the worlds you visit in each of these games are the same worlds you already visited in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, which makes a lot of the games feel like rehashes of the first ones. Especially when you're wanting to play all the games in order. By the time you finish 358 over two days, you're like, can we please never go to Agrabah again? Ever. Please. Now, this is not to say that none of these games add to the story of the Kingdom Hearts lore. They do, and I do consider them all to be full games in the series that need to be played for the full experience. It might be hard to explain to some of you who haven't played any of the Kingdom Hearts games, so let me try to put it in a different way. It would be like if in the next three Assassin's Creed games, you were going to the same cities every time. And also, you had to go to Agrabah every single time, and I'm so sick of you, Aladdin! Take your magic carp with you and go! For number 9, I put Darkseed, a little-known MS-DOS game based on the art of H.R. Geiger. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Alien series is also based on Geiger's art, and I love the Alien series, so of course I love this game. It's a gorgeous and grim point-and-click adventure about a man having to travel between the real world and the alien world to save reality. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, it is, if you follow a step-by-step -step guide or just like replaying the game 43 times before getting it right, because this is one of those games where you have to do everything in a certain order at a certain time to finish the game. And some of this stuff is absolutely insane. Like, why would I know to pick up this bobby pin right here so I can get out of prison later? Or what about that time you have to grab this guy's gun, but not on the first day, it has to be on the second, or you die? How about filling a car's gas tank with scotch? Like, who would think to do that? It's really a shame because if this game wasn't so strict or even just helped you out a little bit, this could have been a cult classic. Now, for my number eight, I know a lot of you are gonna groan when I remind you of this, but hey, you chose to watch this video, Halo 4's Final Fight. For those of you who haven't played this particular entry in the series, it's actually pretty good. I think 343 Studios did a great job making this sequel, right up until the end, where the final fight of the entire game is a quick time event. Now, I actually really like quick time events. They help the player feel like they're actually doing something cool without having to actually be cool. It usually makes for some cool scenes, but as a final fight in a first person shooter? No. This left so many players with such a sour taste in their mouths that people still view Halo 4 as the worst in the series to this day, aside from maybe Halo 5. It's a shame because I think it was a pretty good game, but what are you gonna do? And at number 7 we have Guitar Hero Live. This is actually a pretty fun game. The live idea is really cool, and the online functionality gives you hundreds of songs to play, but its fatal flaw is that it doesn't feel as good to play as the originals do. Now I'm not throwing shade at the new button layout because I actually like it, but the way the game was made, you just don't get the same feedback as you did with the original style, and it's a shame because I really wanted a modern Guitar Hero to play. But I guess that won't happen. Coming in at number 6, we have Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon. The original Luigi's Mansion is a classic, with a detailed atmosphere and addicting gameplay. The sequel introduced new mechanics, monsters, and multiple mansions. It could have been possibly even better than the original, and it still is a pretty terrific game. But the one thing that ruins it is how segmented the game is. Each objective is split into missions, which is completely different from the free roaming style of the original game. It's just a bummer when you have these huge detailed mansions to explore, but you are pulled out every five minutes by Dr. Babyface here. Yeah, I went there. Sorry, EGAD, but somebody's gotta take the blame. For number 5, we have Legend of Zelda Wind Waker in that flipping Triforce hunt. Like, wow. I love Zelda, and I love this game, but this quest where you are given relative locations of multiple pieces of the Triforce, and then you have to spend hours sailing around and fishing for them? we It's not the worst thing in the world, but yeah, definitely a fatal flaw. Next up is Batman Arkham City, in the fact that it's just a mess. Now, I love all the Arkham games, especially Arkham Knight, and one reason I prefer Knight over City is that it's organized. It's easy to tell what objectives and side quests you have and how close you are to completing them, but in City, you have no such help. I loved City the first time I played it, but after revisiting it, it's very apparent how terrible the layout of the city is, how inconvenient it is to travel from place to place, and how scattered everything is. As I've been saying a lot this video, it's still a fun game, but the organization is what keeps me from going back. 
Clean your room, kids. Number three is a huge disappointment to me seeing as it's one of my recent favorite games. Persona 5 is a near flawless game, and the reason for that is the boss fights. In most turn-based RPGs, you learn to use different attack types to weaken your foes, such as poison, maybe something to lessen their attacks or defense, and some games give every enemy type a weakness. For example, in Persona, there are many types of attacks like fire, ice, electrocute, wind, and most enemies have a weakness to one of those. I say most because the bosses have no weaknesses. And that's the problem. On most bosses, none of the status elements even work. You can't poison them, you can't lower their attack, all you can do is hit them until they topple over, and that's no fun. I get they were trying to make the bosses a challenge, but making them big punching bags isn't a challenge. It's just plain frustrating. And for number two, we have the original Super Mario Bros, and again, the bosses. Now, it goes without saying that this is a classic and almost single-handedly pulled the video game market out of a crash. But today, and I'm sure even back then, the one fatal flaw about this game has to be the bosses. The first few times you fight Bowser is pretty exciting. You run past him as he jumps, grab the hammer thing, and watch him fall. But it's the last few times you fight him that it's a disappointment. This goes back to the Halo 4 thing, where the final boss is no different or harder than the first boss and it just doesn't feel all that satisfying. When you play a game, you expect there to be a big finish, but in Super Mario Brothers, it's more of a, yay, you saved the princess. Cool. And finally, at number one, we have Sonic Adventure, with its fatal flaw being Big the Cat. Now, I'm not saying Sonic Adventure is a perfect game. It isn't, at all. It's fun, but there are a lot of problems with it. But if there was one huge gaping fatal flaw about this game, it is no question Big the Cat. Let me ask you something. If you were to make a 3D platformer, would you put a fishing game in it? No! Of course not, because that's stupid. Well, that's what Big the Cat was, and it was the worst. It didn't even play well. I'm sure any time anyone replays Sonic Adventure, the one part they dread going back to is Big the Cat, and I don't blame them. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video, and as always, please consider subscribing to my channel, The Toka Show, and give that bell a ding -a ling ling so you will be notified for whenever my new videos come out. Also, why not follow my Twitter? I sometimes talk on there, and you guys can interact with me and know what's coming up in the future. Sorry about my hiatus, I've been working a ton because I don't get paid by YouTube. Wish I did, that'd be cool. Uh, maybe someday, but not now, so I gotta, gotta work like a normal, nor any normal folk. Kinda sucks, but, uh, you know. <laughs>